Okay, good evening ladies, gentlemen, uh, boys and girls. Thank you for coming everybody on a cold, chilly uh, January Thursday evening. It's nice to see so many of you here. Um, for the regulars amongst us, um, to have over 100 people here is quite baffling and, and wonderful in the same time. So um, um, I, I can only put that down to Kate's wonderful talk title and what you're about to hear. So, um, just to introduce our speaker this evening, this is Dr Kate Lancaster from the School of Physics, Engineering and Technology at the University of York. Um, Kate's an experimental plasma physicist with expertise in inertial fusion energy um, uh, and intense laser plasma interactions. Um, her research is in the field of experimental laser plasma interactions has an emphasis on fast electron generation, uh, transport and heating of dense matter. Um, so that's our speaker this evening. In the usual fashion, can we make sure that phones are off or on silence? If you've got any questions, hold on till the end of this evening's talk. There'll be a bit of a Q&A. Um, but let's give a nice North Staffs welcome to our speaker, Dr. Kate Lancaster. Okay, right. So thank you very much for coming to, uh, to see me. That was definitely worth the more than two hour drive to come over here, which I kind of forgot it was quite far from York, but never mind, we're here now. So, uh, so uh, yeah, thank you for, for coming to watch. Um, I'm gonna be asking the question, is it possible to build a star on Earth, right? Uh, that might sound like I'm just playing around wasting taxpayers' money, uh, and that might still be true, but hopefully what you'll see is actually, it's the story of how People like myself are trying to make fusion a reality uh, here on Earth, uh, rather than just in the sun and the stars. Uh, so hopefully at, at the end of this talk, you'll know a little bit more about some of the headlines in the news that you've been hearing recently and the excitement that, that we're feeling right now uh, and the hope that we're feeling for the future. So I took this picture out of a very tall building window uh, when I was at a conference in Yokohama and if you don't know Japan very well it's sort of Tokyo and Yokohama are kind of squidged together so this is this is looking out over the kind of diaspora of Tokyo from Yokohama and I think it kind of summarizes the the problem here which is that we're energy addicts like you look out there it's just lights 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 you know and as the population on planet earth increases it will probably stabilize around 10 billion but that's a lot of people isn't it and also a lot of lives and a lot of qualities of life to improve and so we're going to need more energy as we get through uh, the next century and the unfortunate problem is unless we do something about how we generate energy um, with new and innovative sources uh, we're going to be a bit screwed I'm afraid uh, so after about 2100 there's definitely going to be a deficit with what we need and what we have right um, so my apologies, that's bad news. Uh, however, this is the only sort of sad bit, hopefully. Um, hopefully beyond now, we'll, we'll be able to uh, give you some reassurance that maybe we'll do something uh, excellent in terms of energy generation. And we're not the only part of the story, I will say this, right? And I'll keep saying it all the way through. Um, so if we put our scientists and engineers hats on now, bit of audience participation, right? We're gonna design an energy source from scratch. What, what do you want it to be able to do? Shout me some things out, right? Renewable. Renewable, exactly, yeah. Anything else? Cheap. Oh, that's an interesting one. I'll come back to that. Uh, anything else? Clean, limited. Clean, yeah. I had one up at the back there. Unlimited. Unlimited, yeah. Production can be scaled up to demand. Do you want a job? <laughs> These are all fabulous uh, suggestions. I think most of them are on there, yeah? So, absolutely, if we're designing an energy source from scratch, we've been pretty rubbish about doing things cleanly in the past. We need to get better at that. If we're going to have something that's going to last into, long into the future and not have, create an impact on our environment and our own health, right? Um, then we ought to be very clever about how we uh, design these uh, things. It has to be sustainable. It's pointless building an energy source around something that's going to run out immediately, right? So it has to be basically virtually unlimited in its supply. <clears throat> it's got to be reliable. Now, uh, I'm going to show my age here and probably alienate young people in the audience, but if you remember the Creature Comforts adverts, right? Turn off and honourable. 
Um, we need energy on demand. We need to be able to turn it on and off when we want it, right? Um, and so somehow we need to factor that into any energy source that we uh, design for the future. It's got to be safe, right? Because it's going to be in our locale somewhere along the line, right? So even if it's like along the M1 corridor, like, you know, the big coal power stations, whatever, it's still quite near us. So we definitely want it to be, to, to be safe and, uh, in terms of our own personal safety, etc., and also proliferation and things like that. Now, I've got cheap with a, with a question mark because um, I suspect we are over the era of cheap energy, unfortunately. We've kind of made hay while the sunshine and uh, now, now not so much, right? So um, I think we can do as good as potentially, but I don't think we could do better than. Um, but then I'm not an economist, I'm just a physicist. So what do I know about these things, right? I just fire lasers into things. So that's a hell of a shopping list, is it not? Right, so what do we do here, right? Well, we can look out into our own dear universe that you can see behind you here, well, behind me, in front of you. Um, and here are our stars and galaxies shining away um, belting out light and energy into the universe. Now, if you zoom into one of those stars, there are nuclear reactions happening, uh, light atoms coming together to fuse to make heavier products and a release of energy, right? That process is called nuclear fusion, right? And um, it's essential for stars to shine and therefore essential for life on Earth without the sun doing its thing as a big giant nuclear reactor in the sky, we wouldn't have light and heat. We wouldn't be able to live on this planet. Also though, something much more profound in a way uh, happens inside the center of stars with this nuclear fusion, right? Because you start fusing and fusing and fusing up to heavier elements, up to iron. Iron's very stable. It's one of probably the most stable element uh, in our lexicon, all right? And uh, so there's lots of iron in the centre of stars. And indeed, if you want to go beyond iron, you've got to have some kind of supernovae to get like higher, higher um, Z particles, right? So heavier particles. Um, and it's because of nuclear fusion that any of the atoms that make us up, our bodies, the bench, the air, it was all fused in the centre of stars and produced, and we're all just made of bits of star, star, you know, everyone, everything is a direct product of nuclear fusion, right? So we wouldn't be here at all, the stuff that makes us up without it. So it's just so fundamental for life in the universe that uh, how can we live without it? Well, we can't. And so it'd be really exciting to be able to capture the energy source of our stars in miniature, in our own very little miniature star that we could turn off and on uh, whenever we wanted, right? So that's the idea. It's well hard, just so you know. <laughs> so how do we recreate what's happening in the stars on Earth? Well, we don't do quite exactly what the sun does, but we do take two types of hydrogen. There are two isotopes of hydrogen, one called deuterium and one called tritium. So um, deuterium is present in seawater in absolutely enormous amounts. For every 6,000 hydrogens, there's uh, one deuterium. So vast quantities, so um, it would hopefully be virtually inexhaustible in its supply in terms of the amount of energy that we need. Um, our friend tritium, however, uh, not so much for every 10 to the 17 hydrogens, so that's one and 17 zero hydrogens, there's one tritium, right? It's not stable, which is why. So it's not naturally occurring. So you might think, well, Kate, you guys are very silly to base an energy source on something that's not naturally occurring. That might still be true. However, we have a fix to this. We can make it. And, uh, and I'll tell you how in a minute. So supposing we've got lots of deuterium and tritium, uh, we need to... Um, <clears throat> give them lots of energy to fuse together, right? Uh, and when they do, briefly for a fraction of a second, and then they become helium, a helium nucleus, otherwise known as an alpha particle, and a neutron. And the neutron 
carries away most of the kinetic or moving energy uh, of the reaction. And it's the neutron we'll come back to with regards to tritium. So where does the energy come from? Well, so this is the only equation uh, in the talk, E equals mc squared. It's probably the most famous equation in the world, right? What does E stand for? Energy. Yep, mass, M, sorry, just shout it out. <laughs> Pretend I didn't say that, M. Yeah, mass. yeah, and C. Speed of light. Yeah, speed of light. So energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Uh, Einstein said that the speed of light is constant in whatever reference frame you're in. So whether you care about what that means or not, what it means for us here is that it's a constant. Not only is it a constant, C is a big number, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, so C squared is a very big number, right? But what that means then, if C, C squared is a constant, energy and mass are intimately related to each other, all right? So what does that mean in practical reality? So if we take the mass of deuterium and we take the mass of tritium, add those masses together, give them the energy to do their thing, and then again, add the masses of the resultant particles together, you'll find there's a mass loss between the first bit and the second bit and the resulting part. So if we take that tiny little bit of mass, times it by C squared, you get huge amounts of energy, right? So that's how, that's how we get so much energy. That's how it's so efficient at producing energy. So that's very exciting to us, all right, as a, as a way of getting energy out. Now, let's come back to the tritium problem. So I said that the neutron is important here. The neutron carries away most of the kinetic energy of the slight billet of balls kind of crashing together and, and, uh, and then moving apart. The kinetic energy uh, of the neutron is higher, right? And so we somehow want to capture that energy. So what we can do is surround the reactor with lithium. Lithium is very abundant in the Earth's crust and in brines. Uh, apparently we have brines in stuff in uh, Cornwall, <laughs> of all places. So uh, we might be all right in the UK for, for this sort of thing. Um, so, but obviously we're in competition with uh, EV and stuff like that as well. So uh, we'll have to have a scrap somewhere along the line. Um, but lithium is really important because when the neutrons fly out and they interact with the lithium, they undergo nuclear reactions. And that nuclear reaction produces tritium. So it becomes a surface area problem. If we can cover enough of the reactor with lithium to generate enough tritium to feed it back into the reactor, then we're all good. So that's, that's the idea. I've made it sound very straightforward. Uh, we've never done that in practice. Um, we know that the nuclear physics works, of course, but it's, a, it's about the amount that you can do. That's the, that's the key thing. So hopefully if we sort that out, then we're all golden. Now, I say it's a very efficient way of producing energy. The energy that you get from burning 40 tonnes of coal, which is obviously what we did rely on in times past, gives you the same amount of energy as the deuterium released, so basically the deuterium in half a bar full of seawater and the lithium in a laptop battery, right? So I talk about lithium because obviously I said I need that to, to generate tritium. So it's the raw materials, right, that we're talking about here. So half a bottle of seawater and the lithium in the laptop, that is not a lot, right? It's very efficient in terms of its fuel usage. But there's something really profound about that half a bar full of seawater and the lithium in the laptop battery is that it's basically one of your lifetime's energy needs sorted. So for the whole of the rest of your life, that's the fuel that you would need to power your life through fusion. So this is why we've been working for a number of decades on it. It's kind of the holy grail of physics, among other things, right? And uh, it would be very exciting if we could have this as an energy source, simply because it is very uh, efficient um, in terms of the amount of energy that you need, or rather the little amount of fuel that you need in order to get this to work. There are other advantages to fusion too. Now, I will put my cards on the table here. I'm going to talk about fission for a little bit, which is what we have now, which is splitting big atoms into littler ones. This is how we generate nuclear energy now. I am in no way against fission. I think it's an incredibly important part of going carbon free because we don't have fusion, right? This is why I'm standing here talking to you about it because it's a fun, interesting project, but we haven't done it yet, right? Fission works, right? So we definitely need to do it. 
but there are downsides to it. So when I say about downsides, I'm not saying fission's rubbish and we shouldn't do it. What I mean is we've got better options in the future is, is my position on this. You may feel differently, but this is, this is where I'm at. Um, so when we're talking about fission power stations, we're taking big atoms and we're splitting them into smaller atoms. That does produce very long lived radioactive waste. It is a burden on future generations. We are getting better at understanding how we can deal with that waste, um, which is good because even though I talk about nuclear fusion, you know, there's helium and an alpha particle, blah, blah, blah neutrons, um, actually there isn't no nuclear waste produced. As soon as you start monkeying around with the atom, you will get some, right? In our case, what happens is these neutrons are going out all over the place. They're interacting with the walls of the reactor. And that will do what we call activate the walls of the reactor, i.e. make radioactive elements in the walls. Um, but this, so it, they will become radioactive, but it won't be long-lived radioactive waste. It's stuff that's dealable within a lifetime, right? So, so this is good. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. The minute you start mucking around with atoms, you will get some radioactive waste. This is far less of a burden, all right? So we still need to deal with it, uh, but it's just, it certainly won't be anywhere near as bad as what we have uh, from, from the fission. <laughs> uh, also with fission, uh, you have to keep your eye on the ball, right? Because the fuel rods in the reactor, you have to carefully moderate the reactions all the time, right? Um, and so subject to error, particularly human error, if you see picture up at there is uh, Chernobyl. Um, I talk about Chernobyl because very few of these accidents happen, right? A very few. There's been a, ha a handful because actually fission is incredibly safe. And when it becomes unsafe is when humans do stupid things, right? So, um, so this is the main thing is that we have to have really, really good systems to, you know, to keep these things safe. However, fusion, hurrah, right? We only have a very small amount of fuel present at any given time in a fusion reactor. It is inherently safe. You can turn a fusion reactor off, it stops dead. There's no reactor heat, there's none of that business, right? It's great, we really know, we've done for many years, we're really good at making fusion not work, right? It's really easy to make it not work. You just turn the thing off. So, it's inherently safe. You won't get stuff like this happening like Chernobyl. Um, last but not least, the thing that we really care about in the near term is it doesn't produce carbon, right? And that is the thing that we need to get around. Now, in no way am I promising you that the near term problem that we need to solve within the next 12 years is going to be solved by fusion. It won't. We haven't done it yet. That's why we need all of the things in our arsenal now, like fission and renewables, to, to help us do that in the near term so that when fusion arrives, we'll have a sustainable carbon free future based on a mix of those energy generation methods, not just fusion. Because as we know, putting all your eggs in one basket is a really stupid thing to do, right? And also different horses for different courses as well, right? Depending on what, what you want the energy for. So after all that hard sell, <laughs> we get to the crux of the matter. How the hell do you actually do it, right? In order to get fusion to work on Earth, uh, we don't have the time or the size of reactor that the sun is, right? So we have to be a bit more cunning. We have to heat the material in order to get enough reactions going to about 10 times hotter than the centre of the sun. The sun is about 15 million degrees Kelvin, or centigrade, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we need to go to 150 million degrees, right? And we need to keep that matter together without <coughs> touching it such that all of the deuteriums and tritiums can fuse together and produce energy. That sounds like a hard ask, right, doesn't it? So how do we go about this? Well, the sun is really smart, right, because it's big, so it just uses its own gravitational field and time, right, because it takes ages for this stuff to happen. He's, um, it's just a big ball using its own gravitational field to, to keep itself together, right? But we don't have either time or a lab the size of a star on Earth. That would be ridiculous. So we have to be a bit more clever about how we do this. Um, and we can utilize some of the properties of matter that it gets to um, when you heat matter to these kind of temperatures. So on that note, we're familiar with solids, liquids, and gases, right? This is what most of 
our personal universe is made up of. Um, but it turns out most of the universe is actually made up of something called plasma, right? I say most of the universe, most of the visible universe, which is a tiny fraction of the actual universe. Most of this weird stuff called dark matter and dark energy, which I know nothing about, so I'm not going to tell you about it. Actually, we don't know anything about it anyway. It's not just me. <laughs> um, but the matter that we do have, it's a visible matter. Most of it is plasma. What is plasma? Well, if you think about the atom, you've got the nucleus with the electrons kind of whizzing around the outside. Eventually, if you add energy to that system, the electrons can gain enough energy that they can part company with the nucleus. So what you're left with is a kind of soup of charged particles, the electrons and the ions all swimming around together. And that soup of charged particles is plasma. So most of our universe that we can see and detect is made of this stuff. So we are very lucky to be solids, liquids and gases, because most of this is, is plasma of varying densities and temperatures and all sorts of stuff. Lightning, aurora, the strip lights, oh, well, these must be LED lights now, right? But uh, the old strip lights were filled with plasma. It's all around us, right? Um, you just didn't know it. <laughs> well, you might have, but anyway. So, Hence why I'm a plasma physicist. I sit in the York Plasma Institute. We have to understand this stuff, which is kind of the sort of stroppy teenager of the states of matter world. It kind of, whatever you want it to do, it will do basically the opposite. So it kind of, it's lots of instabilities. It's very subject to kind of weird happenings, let's say, which tend to make doing fusion particularly difficult in terms of stability, all right? Um, but there are also upsides to how we can maybe utilize some of its properties to help us with this confinement problem which is the crux of fusion. How do you confine this stuff without touching it? So I really love this quote, right? So this is a senior guy at the CNRS, which is a French research organization. They are gonna be responsible for delivering the next step, one of the next step devices in the south of France uh, called ITER, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, physicists aren't silly, we like sunny holidays. <laughs> I say that about 30% of why I went into physics is because I knew I would get to travel the world, and I have, so that's good. <laughs> um, so he said, we, we say that we will put the sun into a box. The idea is pretty. The problem is we don't know how to make the box. Now, um, that's probably a little bit disingenuous. We have a pretty good idea how to do it. It's just simply we haven't done it yet, right? So this is the crux of the matter. How does one actually do all of this stuff? in ordinary matter, right? Uh, and that, that, that's what we're trying to figure out. So there's basically three knobs you can twiddle in order to make fusion work, right? Now, in the kind of fusion I'm discussing here, because I don't talk about cold, cold fusion because it's very silly, um, but anyway, <laughs> um, if you want to overcome the Coulomb barrier, right, which is what we mean by two charged particles, of light charge, trying to push them together. They don't want to go together. You need to heat it to high temperatures. So temperature is somewhat non-negotiable, right? There's a bit of play, but not an awful lot. So we really only have two buttons to press here. One is the density of particles in your system. And the other is what we call the energy confinement time, i.e. how long you can keep it all together whilst you're producing net energy. If you're not producing net energy, then there's no point. So how long can you keep that together for and produce net energy, as in more energy out than you put in? So there are sort of two main ways, let's say, of approaching this. You can keep a moderate density of particles together for a very long time, or a very high density of particles together for a very short time, but then do it over and over again. And it just so happens that the two sort of main ways of doing fusion tend to tend to fall into those two camps. So this is where we talk about what the boxes will be in order to contain our super hot 150 million degree Kelvin plasmas. Um, there are there's loads of variations on the theme of, of fusion devices, but they tend to largely fall into these two camps, right, of um, moderate density of particles for a long time or high density of particles for a very short time. Um, I will use this pointer, actually. It's quite fancy. So if I point on the screen, can you see that? Yeah. So what we've got here is uh, what's called a tokamak. 
So it's, a, it's essentially a donut-shaped magnetic bottle. This particular donut-shaped magnetic bottle is called the Joint European Taurus, and it is on UK soil. Well, actually, it used to be on EU soil, but I think since we've left the EU, it's not, I don't know what it is anymore, but you, it was technically EU soil on this little tiny patch of uh, device. Um, it's a European project, but it is a global project as well. Many scientists from all over the world come and use this, but I'll talk a bit about it later. But, but ostensibly, um, it's a device that uses specially shaped magnetic fields to basically levitate a very hot plasma in the centre of it so that it's not touching the walls. Um, and so it's basically the way of keeping a mod moderate density of particles together for a very long time. On the other side, so that's called magnetic confinement because you're using magnetic fields to kind of hold this very hot plasma. On the other side, uh, this is what I do sort of tangentially, is what's called inertial confinement fusion. Uh, what you're doing there is um, you're basically uh, taking maybe 200 of the world's most powerful lasers, I say this with a glint in my eye, and you crush a pellet of deuterium and tritium to very high densities, and then the idea is you do it over and over again. So it's kind of like a fusion-powered diesel engine where you compress the fuel till it self-ignites. Now, obviously, there's a lot of physics under both of these mechanisms. We're going to touch briefly on it, um, but obviously we'd be here till Christmas if I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> I give an 18 lecture course on ICF, so yeah, <laughs> we haven't got time for that, but at least give you a flavour of the kind of, maybe some of the physics problems with these things. So, first of all, let's examine uh, magnetic confinement fusion and how it kind of works. So if we remember back to our school physics, and some of you, that wasn't so far away, eh? Um, you remember the hilariously named right-hand uh, screw rule, where if you've got a current carrying wire, so if you all hold your thumbs up, right? I only do this for a bit of self-validation, right? <laughs> um, if the current is going up your thumb, right? This is your right hand. Um, a magnetic field will be generated that wraps around that, mag that wire, right? So if we can make the plasma, because it is made up of charged particles, if we can make that have a current flowing through it and it be confined on axis, then a magnetic field will be generated around it, which acts to squish that plasma together on axis in that uh, sort of tube. Now that's great because you're confining in one dimension, sort of one sort of axis, but of course, the plasma could squeeze out the ends, so what's the point of that? Well, you close the ends, and this is why we've got this donut shape. Now, of course, it's much more complicated than that, right? So, what we actually have here is a cartoon of a tokamak, and it is rather much more complicated than this, but nonetheless, this is just sort of a basic version. What we have in the middle, what's called an inner poloidal field coil, right? What that does is it generates a current which flows around the middle of the donut. Now that's our current I was just talking about. That's gonna generate a magnetic field that wraps around the plasma, confining it. But however, um, we also need another axis of confinement because the pressures are unbalanced. Basically, the end, what you end up with is the, the particles will just go onto the wall, right, eventually. So we need to kind of make sure that doesn't happen. Oh, this is weird, isn't it? Um, I think it's because I'm left-handed. I blame everything on me being left <laughs> Um So we have these things called toroidal field coils. These toroidal field coils create a magnetic field that goes around the centre of the donut. This magnetic field combines with the original mag magnetic field that you've generated to make a helical magnetic field. So what we know about plasmas is they're made up of charged particles. Charged particles absolutely want to follow field lines. So if you make a specially shaped, twisted magnetic field that goes all the way around the donut, all those little charged particles are just going to truck around, around and around and around those magnetic field lines and not touch the wall. So that's how we do it. Now, it also needs to get hot, right? So 
You've got ohmic heating, which is basically passing a current through something, so that takes it up to a certain level, but we need something else. So what do you do when you're at home and you want to make something hot pretty quick? Yeah, but what devices have you got in your kitchen? Quicker than that. Yeah, microwave, awesome. Right, so you can microwave it, right? So essentially you fire a load of really high power microwaves into the device, that wiggles the, the particles, and then those particles undergo collisions with other particles, and it makes it hot, right? So that's what we do. Now, I've, I think, because I'm not an MCF person, all of my MCF colleagues will be rotating in their MCF seats going, ah, can't keep describing it in such a basic way, but this, you know, this is, this is roughly how it works, right? Um, <clears throat> groovy. Now, this is um, the inside of the joint European torus during a shot. These don't last for very long, some seconds, right? So, this is what it looks like. So what you can, I'll let it play and then I'll tell you what you'll see. actually because um, you've seen how it sort of fires up right now what you can see here is well the pinky stuff well it's plasma right so you might think oh this is very glowy that's the hottest bit no the hottest bit uh, is the bit you can't see because that's emitting in photons that you can't see right when stuff gets hot um, Eventually, you get uh, emission, right? Uh, the emission will be in UV into X-ray, right? So you won't, you won't see it, right? The stuff that you can see is the coolest stuff, right? Okay, so what you've got here at the bottom is what we call the diverter. The diverter is basically the exhaust pipe uh, of, the, of the tokamak, because eventually particles and debris will lose, uh, lose their position in the magnetic field and come down and be swept down into, into the bottom. Full scale devices, this is one of the big problems with full scale device, um, they have to take heat loads that are incredible, something like landing a spaceship on the surface of the sun, right? It's incredibly hardcore. This, this is where you find at the bottom here. Uh, the biggest issues with, with materials, science and everything that we need to solve in order to get it to work. But I will say that there's been some recent experiments about spreading the heat load out by using shaped magnetic fields that have worked really well, which is really cool, so hurrah! And there's experiments going down um, at, at devices at Cullum, which is where the jet is based, um, in order to solve this stuff. So we're getting there. Right, next slide. So let's talk a bit about laser-driven fusion now, uh, inertial confinement fusion, um, where ostensibly there's no active confinement, it's just the inertia or the propensity to keep moving of, of, the, of the fuel that you're compressing. There are sort of two main ways of doing it. Uh, what's called direct drive, where you just slam the lasers directly onto the pellet and compress it. Or there's another way of doing it, which is called indirect drive. And um, this is what you will have heard about in the press recently um, at the National Ignition Facility, which I will talk about later. <coughs> Excuse me. This here is a little gold can called a hole ram. The lasers get fired into that gold can. There's nothing magic about it. Basically, those lasers make that gold can hot. Hot things emit. And that gold can emits in the X-ray and X-rays do the compression of the, the capsule. So they're the two main ways of doing inertial fusion. There are, there are other non-laser driven ways of doing it as well. There's a company in the UK that has a non-laser driven form of inertial fusion. Um, very exciting. Anyway, I'm talking about lasers because that's what I do. So, um, so there's these two main ways then. Indirect drive, which where the lasers heat the, the whole run. Um, and then compress the pellet, and then the other way, which is just the lasers being fired directly on the capsule. And you can see the size of these things, right? The pellet itself is about a millimetre, like it's, it's a tiny little ball bearing, 
And, you know, that's about a centimetre, that hole around there, right? So, tiny, tiny. So, how does inertial confinement fusion work? Well, um, it's essentially very Newtonian, uh, right? So, you take some very powerful lasers and you fire them onto the outside of a pellet. You spherically, symmetrically irradiate that pellet. Now, that pellet's going to heat up very rapidly and material's going to fly away in a process called ablation. Has anyone had their eyes lasered in here? No, yeah. You have, right. So when your eye was in the way of that laser, your cornea was being ablated. Now, needless to say, your eye would not be in the way of these lasers because you would game over. You wouldn't be sitting here. Um, so it's a much more violent ablation than, than your eye. Um, but of course, if you've got matter ablating outwards, oh, you know, Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? Like, just like when you let air out of a balloon, the, the air goes one way, the balloon goes another, or a rocket with the fuel going one way, and uh, the, the, the rocket going t'other, this is exactly the same. This is, in fact, rocket equations can be used to explain uh, the hydro of this. So if the outer layer is flying off violently, the rest goes, right, to about a thousand times solid density. And so you think, right, that's fine. Um, but it's also getting hot at the same time. The thing comes together, and as the temperature and pressure start to raise in the middle, it arrests the, the sort of kinetic uh, motion, and that kinetic energy is turned into heating of the, the center of the fuel. That very, very center gets raised to fusion temperatures, and then, um, as you've seen in the reactions between the deuterium and tritium, you produce the neutrons and an alpha particle. That alpha particle, or the helium nucleus, then travels out and heats a bit more. So you get this kind of fusion burn wave that propagates through this sphere. All right, and it just gobbles it up. But then we have to do this over and over again, right? So it's a, done in fractions of a second, some hundreds of nanoseconds, and we're done, right? So we have to do it over and over again, about 10 times a second in order for this to work. And the kind of targets that we use, they're exquisite. Um, I'm the daughter of a tool maker, so I have a, I think, a deep and abiding appreciation of precision engineering far more than physics. And <laughs> I've been studying physics all my life. So um, this really is precision engineering, right? So we've got these tiny little ball bearing sized targets. So you typically, for, you can see which has more funding, right? This is a picture of a direct drive capsule. This is a picture of an indirect drive capsule, right? So indirect drive is the thing that everyone's doing, right? Um, direct drive is what I'm doing. <laughs> um, we'll get onto that later. Um, so this is just like a pizza slice of a capsule, right? So you've got your outer layer, which is plastic. That's what we call the ablator. That's the bit like your cornea, which heats up and flies away. Then you've got DT, solid material. Now you're thinking, well, it's got to be a gas, right? Well, that's what, we've got to make it solid. It has to be cryogenically cold, has to be a solid. And therefore, because of a process called sublimation, you end up with DT gas in the middle as well, right? And it's not very big, a few millimetres, this whole capsule in size. On the other side, the, the indirect drive. So you've got a, a gold hole around here. Um, or some mix. It says cocktail here. That sounds a lot more interesting than it is. It's just a multiple element hole room, okay? Not just a single element. The lasers come in, and then you've got your little capsule in the middle here. You end up with a brilliant ablator instead because it's better at absorbing x-rays, and then you've got your DTI, so your gas fill the same way, right? These, these little capsules, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, they have to be less than a, than a micron RMS smooth, right? So if you think about your hair, that's about 50 microns. So it's a, a 50th of that smooth, so that you don't seed instabilities. Um, these things take, these little, so this is a little hole run, which um, has to be kept cryogenically cold before it's shot. 
all right? That's about a centimetre or so in size. These things take weeks, months to build, and then we vaporise them in 20 nanoseconds. So I think you have to be, as a target manufacturer, you have to be super chill with that, right? I, I don't have the patience for that, right? That would be really upsetting, but I guess that is your destiny as a target manufacturer. You know when you're building these things, uh, they're going to be destroyed pretty quickly, right? Um, so yeah, tiny weeny targets, incredibly high precision engineering. In terms of some of the numbers for inertial confinement fusion, right, the, the, the speed of the velocity at which the, the, the outer layer is ablated is about 10 to the 7 centimetres per second. The fastest thing in the universe that's man-made, man-made, person-made, is um, the Helios 2 uh, probe that was slingshot around the sun. It ended up at about 7 million centimetres per second, so it's an order of magnitude faster than that. And so, ergo, if we're ablating at about 10 to the 7 centimetres per second, the implosion will also happen at that speed as well. So it's pretty fast. At that point, the ablation pressure that's exerted on that capsule is kind of hundreds of megabar. But as you start to compress, you get pressure amplification. And so what you end up with uh, is pressures of hundreds of gigabar. And that's basically the kind of pressures you get in the centre of the sun. It's about 250 gigabar in the centre of the sun. So it's like, you can't even comprehend those kind of... Even I'm talking about it, I'm like, meh, I don't know. <laughs> it's just a lot, right? So these are like really extreme pressures. And the energy for ignition, i.e. getting more energy out than in, in terms of inertial confinement fusion, generally you're putting a couple of megajoules in, something like that. I mean, we don't know quite yet because we haven't... Well, we have done it, but not, not to some great degree. So they put a couple of megajoules in. What is a megajoule? Well, that's about the energy contained in a four-bar Kit Kat, right? Um, <clears throat> but you don't eat a four-bar Kit Kat in 10 nanoseconds, right? I mean, we've all given it a good go. like. <laughs> but um, that's the awesome power of this thing, is that, that it's the energy is delivered in a very short space of time, in a very tiny volume, right? Um, so that's just to kind of give you a bit of perspective about some of the numbers here. So supposing uh, this all works, how do we actually turn it into a fusion power plant? Because that's the question in everyone's mind. This is all very well. Kate's just mucking about, telling us all this amazing science. But in reality, what does it mean to, to make a power station? Um, so you've got... We've got a power station up here on the slide. Um, you can see it's a tokamak, but it could be a, a, a laser inertial fusion device as well. And basically you start, you know, you give your energy to your plasma, it burns away, you uh, get neutrons produced and they fly out, right? And I said before, we have to surround the reactor with lithium in order to generate the tritium. So that's one function of the lithium, right? The other function is it gets hot and it, <laughs> it heats water to make steam to drive turbines so it's a depressingly victorian back end to what is a rather space age way of heating water to be honest uh, it's a glorified kettle <laughs> essentially um but to be fair right um we know how to do that back end we know how to do gas turbines we know what the thermal uh, conversion efficiency is and everything else right so it's great that we can sort of integrate that into infrastructure we already know how to do um that's at this early stage. It might be that we end up doing fusion that we call a neutronic fusion, as in that doesn't produce neutrons, which means we have to capture the energy some other way, i.e. if there are charged particles passed, we can put them through a solenoid, it generates current, that sort of thing. But we are nowhere near that yet, right? So let's get fusion to work, do the boring Victorian things, get the energy, and then we'll worry about the, the real tech stuff later. So that's what we do. Well, I say we do, we haven't done, but we will do. Um, so what, where are we in terms of the actual science, uh, the results, um, and what that means for the future? So we've actually had a really amazing 18 months for fusion in general. Um, some incredible results have, have come out. I'm going to go back to our friend, the Joint European Taurus, uh, in a sleepy little village in Oxfordshire called Cullum. Uh, to unremarkable, very countrified village. And then you've got this amazing uh, science facility just up the road. Um, it has a number of devices. 
but particularly the one I'm talking to you about here is Jet. Now, you can see from the picture, Jet's old. Jet's been running since 1983. So I was four when it started running. Um, it's a fairly chunky device. You can see here that's a standard size plasma physicist there just for scale. Um, so it's a tokamak device, so it's this magnetically confined plasmas that I was talking about. And up until recently, when the NIF had demonstrated, it was the most successful fusion device to date in the world, right? Um, in 1997, which is the year I started my undergraduate, <laughs> funnily enough, um, it, it got a, a fusion record. It produced 22 megadoles of sustained fusion output. So that's 22 four bar kick cats, <laughs> right? Um, this is the only graph I've got in this talk, right? So you've got time along the bottom here, fusion power on the side. So this energy record here is this one here, this gray curve, right? Um, and then back in February last year, I said a few weeks ago there, it's not, I haven't updated this. <laughs> um, uh, back in last February, they reported that they had got a new, um, a new energy record here, right? So they're now at 59 megajoules out, um, and as you can see, uh, this is time in seconds along the bottom. So you can see it's not for very long. It's, it's sustained for a, you know, about six or seven seconds and then it stops. So you might be wondering, well, what on earth were people doing between 1997 and 2022? <coughs> it's for this very reason. We were studying, I say we, this isn't my research area, the royal we. Um, we were studying... Um, how instabilities happen in these plasmas and what we can do to mitigate them because it is instabilities which mean that you can't sustain the plasmas for a very long time it comes back to the thing i was saying about plasmas being stroppy and not wanting to do what you want them to do right um, and so we have to think of ways of kind of mitigating these instabilities um, and most of that research is done with just deuterium because as soon as you put tritium into the reactor, A, you're using valuable tritium, but B, you're also contaminating because tritium isn't stable, right? So um, you, you ration when you do those experiments. Now, so a lot of research has been happening at JET in order to fuel the next step devices. Um, there's two main approaches to kind of overcoming these instabilities. One, you go bigger, or two, you up the magnetic field. Um, until the, till sort of maybe 10 years ago, the only option available was go big. But now we've got developments in superconducting magnet technology, we can go big on the magnets now as well, which means the devices can be smaller, which is very exciting for small fusion as well. Um, the reason why they did this latest experiment is because we need a whole new generation of scientists who know how to operate deuterium tritium because all the people that were doing the original experiment, a lot of them have retired, right? So we needed a new young generation of people to know how to do deuterium and tritium experiments so that they can take them to the next step device. So they were absolutely stoked with that result. It's really good for Fusion to know that we can do this kind of thing and it produces a, a lot of valuable information for the next step device eater. So this maybe is what you want to hear about a little bit because obviously the National Ignition Facility was on the news recently, right? Um, obviously I like this because I'm biased, it's my research area. So the National Ignition Facility is a laser facility that's based in the Bay Area of California. Um, it's 192 beams of blue light that compress, well basically go into a whole room, it's an indirect drive so it goes into a whole room, heats the whole room, the whole room makes x-rays which compress the fuel. Um, it's the biggest laser ever built in the world. It's unprecedented. I think it's the most beautiful laser ever built, but I'm weird in what I think is beautiful. It's in the eye of the beholder, um, but it is stunning. Um, it's been operating since about 08. They've been winding the laser up. They had a dedicated ignition campaign between 2010 and 2012. But needless to say, it didn't work, right? Lots of things went wrong with the physics. Um, their physics did not match the codes, so they lost their predictive capability, which means you don't understand what's going on. Um, 
They then spent a decade unpicking and improving in the most beautiful way the physics in order to understand what went wrong and then how to improve it. And that paid off because um, in early this year, they basically put two, just over two megajoules of laser light into a hole run and got 3.15 megajoules out. Now, that's super exciting to me. Um, they also got an amazing result before that as well. But the reason why everyone got excited about this one is the definition for ignition, as far as the, the National Academy of Sciences is concerned, is that the energy out has to outstrip the laser energy you put in, not just the energy that you manage to couple into the capsule. Because remember what I was saying, the lasers go into the whole room, the whole room gets hot, makes x-rays, and then the x-rays have to couple into the capsule. So actually, really, they're only coupling successfully about 250 kilojoules. So they're actually far outstripping the energy they've actually actively coupled into the field. But they, the definition requires them to outstrip the laser energy. Now, this was very exciting. Obviously, we were all bouncing up and down on the end of our springs and going on the radio and talking about it and stuff. And oh my gosh, it is super exciting. Um, but obviously, we're physicists, so we don't like to get too ahead of ourselves with these things. Um, what does this actually mean in reality? Well, lasers, these particular lasers, they're big glass laser systems, neodymium glass. They're very, very, very inefficient, less than a percent. Right? So this is not wall plug net gain, right? This being said, these are now, I think, what we've done is demonstrate the physics. The problems that we have to overcome to, to outstrip wall plug, I think are engineering problems, and that doesn't mean they're any easier, but they're a little bit more straightforward. One of which is to make more efficient lasers, which we are doing, and particularly um, so I used to work at the Central Laser Facility, which is down in the Rutherford Appleton Lab in Oxfordshire. Um, and I was there for 10 and a half years before coming to York. And um, they have a, an arm of the Central Laser Facility that have developed just these kind of lasers. They're already selling them abroad. They're not quite at the level they need to be at energy-wise for inertial confinement fusion, but we're nearly there. And there are other places around the world doing it as well. These problems will be solved, right? There'll be other physics problems, but this really is a very exciting result. Fusion energy is still a long way fr from us, but this unlocks both hope, because my God, you really do need a lot of hope. This is a long-term energy kind of problem, um, and opens money. Because even people like me, so my research is the, the next step after this, right? Because you can't get high gain from these kind of shots, right? I've been thinking for like my whole career, which is 21 years, What's the next step? How do you get to high gain, right? So, and I always thought myself to be a maverick, but it turns out this is gonna be quite exciting for, for people now. So I feel, yes, I've clung on for 20 years, like maybe, maybe now, maybe now that this will uh, help me get some more money. So that's kind of exciting from that point of view. However, obviously, you know, it's the old adage, oh, it's 30 years away. Actually, the landscape of fusion has changed remarkably in the last 10 years for one reason or another, including these results that I've just told you about. Things are picking up. And I know we're bored of waiting, you're all bored of waiting, right? Um, often it just comes down to dirty old money, I'm afraid, and how much money you can throw at the problem to make it go away, which is largely what it means, right? Um, so the sort of very expensive thing to do is what, do you remember what I was saying with um, in magnetic confinement fusion, there's two ways of getting over these instabilities, go big or up the magnetic field. This is the go big, right? This is ETA. It's being built currently in the south of France in Cadarache. Um, it's a ginormous project. It should produce net energy, about 500 megawatts of power for about 400 seconds. And that, compared to six or seven, is a pretty big deal, actually. Um, I suspect it will be first light towards 2030. Um, so there are people in this room, right, that could be working on ETA and doing the thing, right? Uh, and so it's a very exciting device, very sunny south of France. So, you know, if that appeals, then... Um, 
and it, it's just it's the biggest physics project ever attempted right so the piece of paper that was signed that said we'll do something like ITER was signed by Reagan and Gorbachev in 1985 um, because it's a global project right it, it's a project that's worth about 20 billion euro and so that sounds like a lot of money but globally it's a global project so no single country wants to take the risk of that entire fund so it's kind of divided up like a Terry's chocolate orange and lots of different countries are contributing that's bad because it takes ages, as I've just said, but it's good because then fusion is for everyone and so lots of countries own slices of the IP pie, which is or what intellectual property is, as we like to call it. Um, but we want it quicker. This is a very long term way of doing it. Can we go quicker? Maybe. Obviously, lasers have had great results, but there's also the landscape has changed remarkably. In the last 10 years, the growth in private fusion enterprise has exploded. And particularly, we have some of the best homegrown companies in the world here. Particularly, Tokamak Energy and First Light. They are two homegrown companies. Tokamak Energy includes in the name, that's magnetically confined. Fusion, First Light is inertial, but not lasers. It's impacty kind of driven inertial fusion. Fantastic companies. They've, I remember them when they were tiny weeny. They now have tens and tens and tens of staff, huge amounts of investments, tens to hundreds of millions of pounds from private investors. It's exciting people now. There's a, there's a company on here called General Fusion. They are funded by Google and they're just about to build their next device here in the UK as well on the site of Cullum where Jet is because Jet will be closed soon. So this is all getting very exciting. The other thing is, you know, I said about go big or up the mag field. Well, we in the UK have also decided, well, we want in on this. We want in on this small cord apple kind of tokamak with very high magnetic fields. And so the organization UKAEA that oversees the site where Jet and, and Master are other devices in the UK have instigated this project called STEP to the tune of something like 220 million pounds. It's going to be a working fusion reactor, a demonstration fusion reactor based on this technology. Um, it's in West Burton. So it's about an hour away from York. Uh, the site has been uh, designated. It was an old coal power station, which has been closed or is being closed now. And it's gonna be built on that site. So what a great use of a site. And it's an hour away from us, so we're very excited. We're definitely going to be involved in this stuff. That The aim, it's a very aggressive aim, delivery at 2040. So it's a very optimistic time, very exciting. But what the absolute message you need to take away from this is the following. We've got to move, we're moving from people in lab, jokers in labs like me, to proper commercial enterprises, right? It's, an, it's going to be an industrial endeavour. We need new, exciting engineers and physicists trained to do this. So every young person and old in the audience who finds this exciting, we, we need people, we need bodies on the ground to do this. We can't support these facilities, we don't have enough people. So we need people to come in and do it and get trained. Uh, I will say, I'm, I'm standing in a University of Kiel, but we have a big old training programme at, at York for both uh, undergraduate and postgraduate. So if you're excited, come talk to me about it. Um, but really it is a very exciting time and we need bodies. So that, if that's excited you at all, then uh, do think about it. So on that note, I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you so much for listening and coming out in your big numbers and listening to me talk about fusion. And if you have any questions, please do ask. So thank you very much.